So imagine you're the government of Canada and you have to spend a whole bunch of money to run your country. So for instance you're going to spend uh, 34 billion dollars taking care of the elderly in your country, you're going to spend 12 billion taking care of the children in your country, 24 keeping people healthy, 10 taking care of people who are um, need help, uh, another 30 billion and change to take to make sure people are kept safe from internal external threats these are the things that you need to spend money on and just like anybody any business or person just like you you have to come up with ways to pay for it so you need revenue if you're gonna pay if you're gonna oops, if you are going to um, uh, spend this money right it has to come in if it's gonna go out so what are your options well you could earn it you could ask for donations voluntary so just take a look here quickly there are roughly 34 million people in Canada now maybe 35 by now so you're basically asking for a thousand dollars per person in the country man woman child everybody to take care of the elderly in the country right now so you just do a pledge drive and say, hey, everybody, please give us $1,000 so we can take care of the elderly. Surely everybody would want to contribute to that. Or you could go and say, okay, what we're going to do is we're going to impose a flat fee. So we're going to say this is the same for everybody, and it's basically a price of admission. If you want to be in this country, then it is not voluntary to do so. You have to pay. So pay the fee, you can be in the country, we'll use that revenue to run the country. Or, whoops, it's the fourth option, you could impose a non-flat fee. Everything else being the same, but it is different for different people. So we could have some fun debating about which of these is the right or the most fair option. Um, philosophically and otherwise, but this is the one that we choose in Canada. We impose a non-flat fee, and let's be honest, and now, and we'll call it a tax. So the big question then is, what should this be based on? We want it to be different for different people, so we got to find out, well, how, how do people differ? Well, we could base it on their height, we could base it on IQ, lots of different things that people differ on but what seems to strike the, the best most resounding um, uh, in terms of fairness we'd like to be able to tax people's ability to pay the tax so if you can pay more you should pay more that seems to make good sense the big question now though becomes how on earth do you measure ability So let's think about options for this. So if you want to measure something, how do you do it? Well, we could give everybody a test. So we come up with some kind of standardized test that um, allows us, each person in the country, to take it and determine who uh, has more ability to, to, to pay than other people. Difficulties with administering that, but it's still an option. Or we could do a detailed analysis of each person. So hire a, an army, as it were, of uh, analysts or uh, psychologists to go in and say, okay, I have done my assessment and this person's ability to pay is, and they would give us a dollar figure. Both of those seem great in principle, very, very difficult to implement. The ones that we end up going to are saying well listen we'll make an assumption if you can't could make money if you have the ability to make money then you're making it and so we're gonna tax based on your income what you're making but very very important to note that this is not a perfect measure of ability to pay it's a measure of ability to pay but it is not the perfect measure and then wealth of course is another option altogether and I just want to make sure that everybody has a firm understanding of what the difference between income and wealth is. 
So I've got four people here. Person A inherits, sorry about the writing, a million dollars and puts it in the bank at 3% and has no job. Person C, or sorry, person B inherits a million dollars, puts it in the bank at three million dollars at three percent, sorry, and has a job that pays them one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year. Person C has no inheritance but a job that pays them one hundred twenty thousand dollars a year, and person D has no inheritance, no job, and collects welfare of thirty thousand dollars a year. So, what are these people's incomes and wealth? Well, income and wealth. Person A's income is $30,000. Their wealth, at least at the start of the year, is a million dollars. Person B's is 150 salary and interest, and their wealth is one million. Person C's is 120,000 of income and no wealth, and person D has 30 of income and no wealth. So again, the whole point of doing this is to figure out, okay, what is what is the each person's ability to pay? Well, if we used wealth or we use income to figure out each person's ability to pay, we're going to get very different answers. So let's just look at who has high wealth here and who has low wealth and who has high income and who has low income. Uh, person B is clearly the person who has high of both. Person A has low income but has high wealth. Person D is clearly the low on both. And person C has uh, high income but low wealth. And so if we tax based on income, using income as our measurement of ability to pay, then B and C are the ones who are going to pay tax. So C who has $120,000 a year, a job that pays them $120,000 a year, is going to pay much more tax under our system than person A who has a million dollars in the bank. So it's important to note that we have chosen income as our ability, a measure of ability to pay. So if that is the case, and it is the case in Canada and in most countries in the world, income is the basis of tax. If that's true, then it is absolutely crucial to identify each person's, or corporations, but we'll leave it as this for now, each person's taxable income. So how, what is the actual number that we should be using as our estimate of that person's ability to pay each year? And because this is so important, this is why the Income Tax Act is so thick. So the Income Tax Act is the government's guidelines for defining income. What is income and what isn't? And it gets thicker and thicker because each of us has a bias to say, no, 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 that money that came in this year that, that, that increased my wealth and, and increased my, yes, my income, that's not taxable income. And so the Income Tax Act has to swoop in and say, yes, it is, or no it isn't, um, but to define things clearly. So just as we wrap up here, let me identify for us some things, some biases. So it's important to note this, and we're going to come back to this over and over, because this is why things end up shaking out the way they do. So. In setting, uh, figuring out, you know, who's going to pay what and, and what person, what each person's income is, these are the biases that we want to note. So the government's bias is for fairness. It wants people to be treated fairly. It wants no one doesn't want one person to be advantaged or another person to be disadvantaged. The taxpayer wants that too, but it's a little more nuanced, right? We want fairness to us. So we all know that if you have siblings or friends or you've been out to dinner with more than one person at a time, you know that fairness is a very difficult thing to, to nail down. But it's a goal nonetheless. We also want simplicity. The more simplicity. And so does the taxpayer. 
And the reason we really want this is so that people will comply with it. We want people to pay their fair share. But our bias here as, an, as a taxpayer really is we really want to make sure that everybody else is paying their fair share. We'll take care of ourselves, of course, and, and we have a bias to, uh, to tread the line sometimes on the other side of compliance. But we want to make sure everybody else is, is being kept in compliance. And then the other thing here is we want neutrality. We don't want, and this is a f fancy w word maybe, but um, as we'll talk about, all this means is we don't want the tax to be telling people what to do. We want, we want people to do what they want to do and do what they can do to earn more money for themselves and, and enrich the country as a whole. Um, we don't want the tax to be getting in the way of that. So we all kind of get along on this, the government and the taxpayer. Where we do not get along is in a few very important dimensions. And this is, again, why the Income Tax Act is so thick. Because the government, holding everything else equal, wants higher income, wants your income to be higher, your taxable income to be higher. Why? Because that gives them more revenue and enables them to do more things that they need to do. You, of course, have a bias to have your taxable income, as opposed to your real income, but your taxable income to be lower so that you'll pay lower tax. Whoops, the government wants its money sooner. So it wants to collect tax sooner, and of course the taxpayer wants to hold on to their money as long as they can. So yes, if I'm taxable, please tax me later. And the government wants to have very few exceptions. And of course the taxpayer says, no, 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 I want in all situations, I want to be the one who is the exception, who isn't being taxed. So it's really important that we um, start to internalize these biases because this is going to, this will come back over and over again. This is why, really down here where we agree, um, why the laws have to be written because of uh, the, the taxpayer rightly so wanting to hold on to their money as long as they can and the government wanting it sooner. Um, that's why tax laws become more complicated and we'll spend much more time talking about that.